Ah, 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 This thing I sent my son, just give me one minute and we started. Don't worry. I could talk to them here, right? To the panel first. Yeah, to Dr. Henry. Okay. Ah, let me go. Let me go. Good morning everyone and welcome to OSH Professional Development Seminar. It's the first activity of our OSH Week CCLCS 2023. The theme, a healthy and safe working en environment as a fundamental principle and right at work. Today we have a, a power packed um, panel in Dr. Andre Vincent Henry, who is the director of CCLCS, Miss um, Joanna Borges Henriques, who is the OSH specialist and social protection at the ILO, and we have Miss Marissa Bawani, who is director OSH at the THA. Sit back, relax, and enjoy as for the next 90 minutes or so, you will have. Um, quite an insightful experience in occupational safety and health, especially as we are now a fundamental principle and right at work. Um, what we are going to do this morning is uh, ensure that each presenter will give you a brief overview, maybe 20 minutes or so each, and then we move into a question and answer forum where you can ask your questions um, you can pose your questions on YouTube on Facebook and those will be fed directly to our participants I urge you um, as far as possible to share the live I know we all like to do that now share the live on YouTube on Facebook on wherever you are because this is an experience that you don't want to miss at all this is something that you want to um, ensure that you take notes and you walk with, with it anywhere you go and at the end of it all you will learn something um, in occupational safety and health and of course know that Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies is the premier organization and the home of OSH in Trinidad and Tobago and the region. So without further um, or any further hesitation I would like to bring to the fourth the director Cipriani College, Dr. Andre Vincent Henry. Dr. Uh, Henry Barry, Barry, Mrs. Sancho has joined us. Oh, excellent. So, um, thank you very much. So, um, as Dean, I now hand you over to Ms. Carolyn Sancho. Ms. Ms. Sancho is the executive director of the OSH agency and um, we we are very pleased to have her now to chair the session. So, Sancho, all over to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, morning, morning everyone. Well, well thanks, thanks, Barry, for that introduction, and, and, and thanks for um, taking up the chairmanship while I sorted out my issues. Yes, we indeed have a power packed um, um, panel here today, um, and it's it's really a, a great occasion as we celebrate the World Health um, uh, 
safety um the um the year 2023 um so as mr pratram um alluded to we will have a, a session that goes for about 90 minutes and each each um each participant will then have an um the ability to then present um on various topics after which we'll have a question and answer a session um so in terms of um of order of appearance should we have have we decided um who's going to go first and, and in terms of order of appearance yeah or should we should we introduce um dr henry should you would, would you do your presentation first and then we could be followed by the other presentations yes uh thank you thank you very much uh mr sancho uh, and I, I want to welcome as director of the institution i want to welcome um say first thanks to the the panelists to you um carolyn for agreeing to to chair the session uh, and to my fellow panelists as well as to those who are joining us and participating in this activity uh, i certainly don't need 20 minutes barry because i think the experts have more to say than i do <laughs> but, but what i'd like to do is i would like to start um this discussion off with some with some general observations uh in terms of of policy in general and policy related to occupational safety and health in the in Trinidad and Tobago and in the Caribbean. And while the first part of my presentation is more about doom and gloom, um, I, I want to make some suggestions about a, a way forward and to address some of the policy challenges we, we face. So having said that, I first became actively involved in the issue of occupational safety and health um, almost 35 years ago when I had a stint as advisor to the Minister of Labor here in Trinidad and Tobago back in 1989. And at that time, the drafting of the occupational safety and health legislation was then in progress. And in fact, it was the biggest assignment, biggest single assignment I had during the two years or so that I served as advisor to the minister. At the time when we were going through, this is in the late um, 80s, uh, when we were going through uh, trying to draft modern um, safety and health legislation, the prevailing legislative framework was the factories ordinance and the factories ordinance had been enacted in the 1930s and the factory ordinance itself was based on british legislation that had been passed in 1901 i think so even as we were attempting in trinidad and tobago to address the issue of occupational safety and health legislation, we were almost a century behind. A century behind the science, a century behind the world of work. We were just playing catch up. Um, and interestingly, while we were doing this in 1890, the this wasn't even the beginning of the of the process because when i joined the process the government had already in the early 70s received assistance to engage an australian consultant to draft the legislation mm -hmm. and his report was submitted in 1975. so here we were in 1989 and 1990 working on the basis of a 
a draft that had been prepared almost 15 years before. And that draft was 75 years late in terms of the science because we had, um, as I said, the factory's ordinance was based on the 1901 uh, British, British legislation. Sadly, it was not until 2004 that the legislation was finally enacted. And, you know, so if we look at here we were starting a process to address something that was already um, many decades out of, uh, out of touch, and it took us almost 30 years to get to the legislation finally being enacted in 2004. And there were many things wrong with that torturous process, from the slowness of the legislative process itself to the troubling conclusion that maybe OSH was not recognized as a major priority. And I want to come back to that briefly. As I said in my opening, I am not a scientist, but I remember back in 1989 being troubled by the hazards and risks to which workers were exposed. I was composed as a non, I was concerned as a non-scientist about new compounds that were being uh, developed that were potentially carcinogenic. I was concerned about new industrial processes that were being, that were, that placed workers in danger and for which there was no um, provision for protection. I was concerned about the inadequate oversight arrangements for worker health and safety. And I think we need to recall that when the factory's ordinance was established, established in the 1930s, Point Lisas, with all its heavy industry, did not exist. By 1989, um, Point was, was pumping. In other words, we were operating a policy and a legislative environment that had no relationship to the realities of the world of work. And there were those of us who at the time were concerned that we were really sitting on something of a of a powder keg that could that that, that, that could have exploded with um with, with disastrous consequences. In two years after the OSHA was, come, was proclaimed in 2004, it was amended in 2006. Again, a demonstration that. We kept being behind the um, be, behind the ball. We 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 weren't being anticipatory as good policy is supposed to be. And now, twenty years later, in spite of much talk about the need for amendments, not much has happened. Uh, we've been talking about the need for amendments. We've been talking about the. Um, about the shortcomings in the current legislation and not much happened. And this is in the face that if anything, changes in the world of work have accelerated and will continue to accelerate, making the need for a relevant up-to-date legislative framework even more necessary and urgent. One of the areas that is of great concern to me um, is mental and emotional health and well-being. Um, back in 1989, the concerns were more about physical physical dangers, um, dangerous and hazardous compounds, work processes, operating machinery, and so on. Um, we weren't even thinking then about issues related to, to mental health. But one of the things that certainly COVID-19 has, has showed us is that mental health, mental well-being, emotional health 
is certainly as important um, as the other kinds of, of dangers that workers are exposed to. And what I found though is unfortunately, there are no good studies on the impact of workplace stress and workplace and work-life balance the equilibrium in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. And I'm always very wary about extrapolating from studies from the developed world and even from other developing countries um, to draw conclusions that could guide policy and law and practice in the region. And I just want to flag that um, I am certainly committed that as a labor college, this is a gap that we recognize need to be closed and we need to, to, to do something uh, about it. So the, 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 the first, so one of the points I want to make then is that even as we think about policy for us in Trinidad and Tobago and in the wider Caribbean, I'm always very concerned that the way we develop policy and law must be on the basis of evidence and we need to ensure that we have a good sense of what is the the manifestation of the Caribbean workplace um, if we are to make sure that we have um, the right kinds of policies in place. But you know, as frustrated as I am with the OSH framework in Trinidad and Tobago, I am sadly aware that we are most likely the most well off in the Caribbean when it comes to an OSH um, framework. And that is in no doubt because of the existence of the oil and gas um, industry in the, com in the country and the fact that these international companies that dominate the oil and gas industry, they bring their own culture of occupational safety and health, and we have benefited um, from that. Um, so it tells you about the work that needs to be done in the wider Caribbean. But even if it is true that we may be better off than other countries in, in the region, I think that is no small consolation um, because protection of, of, of workers' health and safety is, is not about who, it, it is not, ideally is not about gradations. It's, a, it's, it's an absolute right. It's an absolute principle that we should try to address. I think the addition of the, a safe and healthy workplace to the fundamental principles and rights at work is welcome uh, for a number of reasons. In addition to bringing the issue to the forefront, I think it creates an entry point for creative action to make the movement and the development of the occupational safety and health framework uh, in the country uh, a lot easier. Well, not a lot easier, but at least we have, we, we can use this as an entry point. One of the things I find in our countries in the region is that too often um, governments don't respond to, to principles in isolation, but they respond to external drivers. And I think the fact that the ILO has establish OSH as a fundamental principle and right, and that that is aligned to the, to the sustainable development goals, that creates a useful, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a useful policy framework that could be used for advocacy and to get some movement in um in our countries for example Trinidad and Tobago like all the other countries of the Caribbean uh have subscribed 
to the multi-country, um, the multi-country monitoring mechanisms under the um, the SDGs, and part of this re re uh, relates to issues related to, to decent work, safety and health, and our governments are required to to submit reports. And I am hoping that what we can see is an opportunity because the, the, this um, this mechanism requires uh, requires one reporting, and the reporting has to be multi-sectoral, so it creates an opportunity for social partners who are interested in the issue of occupational safety and health to be able to point out some of the deficiencies that we see in, in the system. But I think that there are rules for both um, the private sector and workers and their organizations in seeking to advance the issue of occupational safety and health. And in the face of uh, the, in the face of the absence of an adequate national framework, that there is a role to address the issues of um, there are a role and even a need to address the issues of occupational safety and health at the level of the enterprise and at the level of social dialogue. Um, certainly at the bipartite level, at the national level. Um, I'm reminded in the case of Trinidad and Tobago that the procurement legislation, for example, was really driven a lot by um, concerns outside of government. And I think that that might be a useful way to, to, to view how we can get some, some emphasis in, in that. I would I would pause here because I would um, I think that there, that this is a discussion that could be taken further. Thank you very much, Karen. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Henry. Um, it was very apt that you start uh, start this proceedings off, take this proceedings off, because the historical perspective is one that I think is would set set the um the scene for what we then say afterwards. Um, I think. The, the, that walk down memory lane has put it into perspective, you know, what where we have come from. Because they always say that we, we can't know where we are going unless we know where, we, where we're coming from. Um, the, the issue of mental health is something that really is, has become less of a taboo topic now than it was a few years ago. Um, when, I, when I worked abroad, it was something that was that, that really labeled you whenever you had to go to work. So people would not want to, to speak about mental health and stress, but it's something that we are recognizing more now. And I think it's something that employers are, are, are recognizing more now. Um, and it's interesting that you should talk about the um, the work-life balance because, um, and the fact that we in Trinidad and Tobago, um, we haven't seemed to have gone to the point yet of establishing policies for work-life balances. When we, um, I remember in the year 2000, and when I worked in another country, that is when they started something called improving working lives there, so 23 years later, and we are yet to catch up. So we, we are indeed playing catch up for quite a few things, but I think with the ILO's um, declaration now, I think we're probably on the way to where we need to be. Um, I, if we have any questions, that they, they could be invited now, or is it um, we could wait until the end um, for those questions, so we we have to decide on on that, um, Dr. Henry, whether you'd want to take questions now or wait until the end of all the presentations for those questions to come. Dr. Henry, Dr. Henry seems to have gone off. Sorry, sorry, yeah. So, um, no, were you um, were you um, able to take questions? Now, were you going to? So I, I think we agreed that we will do all the questions at the end. At the end, okay, yeah. right. So, um, our second speaker then, um, can we have Miss Marissa Bawani as second speaker then? Um, Marissa, are you are you ready with your presentation? 
Yes, I'm ready. Thanks. Okay, well, welcome, Marissa. Welcome to these proceedings. Nice to see you again. I haven't seen you for a long time. Um, so welcome. Um, Marissa, let me just introduce you. Um, so you, you worked in the Occupational Safety and Health Department for the Tobago House of Assembly from 2012 to present, holding the position of OSH officer to senior of, of OSH officer and currently the director of Occupational Safety and Health Department at the TTA. Um, Marissa has over 16 years of experience in the field, lecturing and sharing her knowledge at tertiary level institutions, namely Supreme College, um, University of the West Indies, and the University of Trinidad and Tobago. She holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Environmental and Natural Resource Management from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, and a Master of Science in Occupational Safety and Health from the University of Greenwich. Welcome, Marissa. Um, it's over to you. Thank you, Director Sancho. Um, so I would just share the screen for my presentation. Okay, so this morning I would be sharing the implications for the employer and employee. So we're looking at the theme um, for this year for World Day for Safety and Health at Work, which looks at a safe and healthy working environment as a fundamental right to employees. And what does this mean for the employer and the employee? What does a, a safe and healthy working environment mean? So we would be focusing this morning on what exactly is deemed a safe and healthy working environment. What is the duty of employers towards that safe and healthy working environment? How an OSH management system, how safety and health policy, how risk assessments, the use of personal protective equipment, training and information, emergency preparedness and maintenance, how all of these work together towards a safe and healthy working environment. We would also touch on the duty of the employees towards this environment and the benefits that an organization can achieve from establishing and maintaining a safe and healthy working environment. So what is a safe and healthy working environment? Well, a safe working environment is a workplace that is free of hazards and risks to the people working there. And a healthy one is one in which there is not only an absence of harmful conditions that can cause injury and illness, but an abundance of health promoting ones. And this was defined by the World Health Organization in 2010. So as an employer or employers, they have a duty to protect the health, safety, and welfare of employees and other people who might be affected by their work activities. Sorry, yeah, who might be affected by their work activities. So if you have contractors coming into your workplace, if you have visitors to your workplace as the employer, you have a duty to protect their health, safety, and welfare as well. Now, the employer must do whatever is reasonably practicable to accomplish this. Um, they are not expected to eliminate all risks, but they do have to do everything that is reasonably practicable to protect persons from harm. And this just means doing what the you as the employer or the employer is reasonably able to do to ensure the, the health and safety of workers and others. So organizations are legally responsible for establishing and, and maintaining a working environment where employees are able to work safely without risk to their physical and psychological health and welfare. So they have a legal obligation to provide a safe and healthy working environment.
All right, so an, a tool or a mechanism that employers can use to achieve a safe and healthy working environment is through the implementation of an OSH management system. The system should contain the main elements which include policy, organizing, planning and implementation, evaluation and action for improvement. Now, the management system concept is based on the principle of the plan, do, check, act, deming cycle. And if you apply this to OSH, the plan part involves the setting of the OSH policy, allocation of resources towards health and safety, your hazard identification and risk assessments. This would come in the planning stage. The do step refers to the actual implementation and operation of the OSH program. And the check step is devoted to measuring if you're actually achieving the targets that you would have set out. And the act part causes you to continually review the system um, in an effort to continually improve your health and safety performance. Now, the ILO has published in 2001 guidelines on occupational safety and health management systems, which can be used to guide employers who want to achieve a safe and healthy working environment. So coming out of the OSH management system, a policy needs to be developed. So a safety and health policy is a document outlining an organization's commitment and approach to managing health and safety in the workplace. This was defined by IOSH in 2023. Now, the policy is ultimately signed off by the person in charge of the organization. And this shows their commitment towards health and safety. Now, research has shown that workers are more productive in workplaces that are committed to health and safety. So if it is shown by the head of the organization, their commitment, then you would have a trickling down to the employees in the workplace. So employers should prepare in writing their policy regarding the safety and health of persons employed in the organization. Now under the OSH Act of Trinidad and Tobago, employers are legally required to do this if they have 25 or more employees. Now the policy should be done in consultation with the employees so they can have their input and they are more likely to buy into the implementation of the policy if they had a say or part in the policy. So the development of the policy should be done in consultation with them. And once the policy is complete, the information should be shared with all employees in the organization in a language that they understand. So you may have employees who speak different languages in your organization, you need to ensure that the policy information is shared to them in a language of their understanding. So the policy usually has um, three sections, the statement of intent, which would set out the organization's aims and objectives towards health and safety, roles and responsibilities. This outlines who in the organization would have the specific responsibility for managing health and safety and what exactly they would be responsible for. And then thirdly, you have the arrangements. This section is usually the largest part of your policy. And this section would detail how risks are managed in the workplace. So another way to establish a safe and healthy working environment is through the use of risk assessments. So to establish a safe and healthy working environment, occupational risks need to be mitigated as far as is reasonably practicable. In order to mitigate a risk, we need to first assess it to determine what are the appropriate control measures to put in place. So employers have a legal duty to assess the risk to the safety and health of their employees. And as we would have mentioned before, 
the to the safety and health of persons who are not in their employment, which would be like your visitors and your contractors, to which they are exposed while they are at work. So this means that they have to identify any hazardous activities that could cause injury or illness and take action to eliminate. Now, if it isn't possible, they need to, well, if it isn't possible to firstly eliminate the risk, then they would need to put control measures in place using the hierarchy of control measures so that the risk can be reduced to an acceptable level. So risk assessments are, well, under the OSH Act of Trinidad and Tobago need to be reviewed yearly. They can also be reviewed whenever anything new is introduced into the organization. So for example, if machinery, new machinery is introduced, if new materials or new substances or procedures are introduced, you would then have to review your risk assessment to now take into consideration these new initiatives that have been introduced. Also, if there is some sort of accident or injury that takes place, you would need to look at your risk assessment again to determine where it would have fallen short in terms of putting the mitigation measures in place. So a risk assessment should be carried out to identify the hazards and evaluate the associated risk that can cause harm to workers so that appropriate control measures can be implemented. The use of personal protective equipment is also important in providing a safe and healthy working environment to your employees. It helps to protect employees from hazards that they may be exposed to in the workplace. So employers must provide suitable personal protective equipment and this personal protective equipment that is being provided must be based on a risk assessment, which we would have spoken about in the previous slide. So based on your risk assessment, that would help you determine the suitable personal protective equipment that would be required to protect employees from the hazards that they would be exposed to. So as we were saying, employers must provide this PPE to employees who may be exposed to a risk up to their health and safety while at work where the risk has not been adequately controlled by other means. So using the hierarchy of control measures that was previously mentioned, if after using those measures to help mitigate exposure to the hazard, and this has not adequately controlled the risk to an acceptable level, then you can look at personal protective equipment as a last resort to control um, exposure to that particular substance. So employers must ensure workers have sufficient information, instruction and training on personal protective equipment use. So it's not just issuing personal protective equipment to the employees. You, uh, as the employer, have to provide information. And this information should include how they should safely store the personal protective equipment, how to maintain it, and what are its limitations. Also, the personal protective equipment should be provided at no cost to the employee. Training and information, as we mentioned in the previous slide, is important in ensuring a safe and healthy working environment. The employer is legally obligated to provide instruction and information and adequate training for their employees for them to be able to work safely. So employers must give workers information about hazards and risk they may face in the workplace. So after conducting your risk assessment, you need to share this information with the employees so that they know the hazards that they are exposed to while they are carrying out their tasks. And also you need to give them information on what are the measures you as the employer are putting in place to deal or protect them from those particular hazards. And also information on how to follow any emergency procedures that may 
any emergency procedures that you would have to use in the event of an emergency as a result of exposure to the particular hazard. So your risk assessment would help you identify whether you need to give the employees any specific training based on the type of hazards that they are exposed to. All right, a safe and healthy working environment is one that is prepared for an emergency where employees should get help immediately if they are taken ill or injured at work. And this is a legal obligation by employers. They must have an emergency plan in place to respond effectively to health and safety incidents and other emergencies that may occur. And again, this plan has to be based on the risk assessment that you would have done. So the plan should include the means of obtaining first aid help and if necessary, transportation to the hospital. As the organization, you should have a suitably stocked first aid kit and an appointed person to take charge of first aid arrangements. And this appointed person is somebody who should be trained in the administering of first aid treatment. Also information for all employees telling them about first aid arrangements. So where would be the location of the first aid room or the first aid kit and who um, is the person who is trained in first aid, who would administer first aid treatment in the event of an emergency. Maintenance is also an important part in ensuring a safe and healthy working environment. So as an employer, you have a legal duty to ensure that the workplaces, machinery, equipment, and processes that are under your control are safe and without risk to health. This includes ensuring that your building is in good repair and maintaining the workplace and any equipment that is safe and works efficiently. Now, usually when we hear maintenance, we think about just maintaining equipment, but maintenance also looks at things like, for example, you have carpet in your workplace and maybe the carpet is torn or worn and it can pose a potential tripping hazard. Maintenance also includes ensuring that the carpet is maintained and replaced as necessary. So this maintenance should be done by implementing a planned preventative maintenance program. And this preventative maintenance program can be designed using the manufacturer's recommendations. This is for equipment. Um, so by using the manufacturer's recommendations, it can help you determine the frequency of maintenance that is required to ensure that that piece of equipment is properly maintained and safe and without risk to health. Right, so the employees also have duties with respect towards maintaining a safe and healthy working environment. Employees have a duty to take care of their own health and safety and that of others who may be affected by their actions at work. Employees must cooperate with employers and co-workers to help everyone meet their legal requirements. Now, what does this mean for the employee? What does it mean that they have a duty to take care of their own health and safety? Um, it means that they have to comply with any instructions that are given to them by the employer for their own safety and health. So if you are given standard operating procedures or safe systems of work to comply with by your employer, you as the employee need to comply with those instructions that are given to you. If you are issued with personal protective equipment, you are required to use the personal protective equipment that was issued to you. You are required to use them correctly based on the training that was given to you and you are required to keep them, um, well, don't purposely destroy them. So you're required not to render them inoperative, right? 
as an employee, you also need to report immediately to your supervisor if there's any situation in your workspace that could present a hazard to you or to your fellow employees. You're also obligated to report any accident or injury to health. So if an accident takes place in the workplace, you need to report this to your employer. These are the requirements for the employee with respect to a safe and healthy working environment. So what are the benefits to an organization having a safe and healthy working environment? The establishment and maintenance of a safe and healthy working environment, well, it helps the organization comply to whatever occupational safety and health laws and regulations exist within their territory. So you know that if you maintain, establish and maintain a safe and healthy working environment, you should be complying with that with safety legislation. Ensuring the fundamental right to a safe and healthy working environment also helps to prevent work-related accidents and diseases from taking place in the organization, and it helps to promote and protect the health and well-being of workers. So with a safe and healthy working environment, you have less accidents, less diseases, you have less um, downtime due to workers taking um, sick leave or due to them being injured or having some sort of illness. So that's another benefit to the organization. And then it's financially beneficial to the organization as disruption and downtime from accidents are reduced. So your business is able to also save money that it would have lost in things such as legal breaches to health and safety legislation, which could have also resulted in prosecution and fines. So it makes good business sense to establish and maintain a safe and healthy working environment for employers, for, or sorry, for employees. And I think that's the end of my time. So thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marissa, for that presentation. Um, I think the, um, the, the points raised were, were, were quite important to the responsibility of employees, of, of employers um, within the country um, in terms of, of policy and risk assessment and so on. It's great that you brought up risk assessment it is always something that people find is quite mysterious in terms of what 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 they what they're meant to do. Um, so your explanation was, was was quite lucid. Um, who who is to be harmed and how they should be how they would be harmed, and then you know what we put into place um, as a result. Um, so following on from 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 that um, presentation. Hello. I yes, think I lost her. We're hearing you. Right. We're following on from that presentation. We. Hello. Just we going in and out. We are calling you. Oh, are you hearing me? Huh? Yes, we're hearing right. you. Okay, great. For the last presentation, we will have a presentation by Miss Joanna Borges. Um, and I will give a brief overview of Mrs. Borges's bio. Um, Miss Joanna Borges is a national of Portugal and joined the ILO Decent Work Team and Office for the Caribbean in November 2022 as a specialist social protection and occupational safety and health. 
Um, Ms. Borges joined the ILO in 2012 as manager and coordinator of technical cooperation projects, which supported the promotion and strengthening of social protection systems and decent work in Portuguese-speaking countries. Later, in 2020-2022, she served as social protection specialist for Central Africa, um, covering nine countries. Prior to joining the ILO, she worked for the Ministry of Labour, Solidarity and Social Security of Portugal. She holds an MSc in Social Policy and Development, a postgraduate degree in Economics and Social Policy and a degree in Economics. Um, Ms. Borges, welcome, and please um, proceed with your presentation. Thank you, and uh, thank you for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So while I do well, welcome, if you will allow me to share my screen and to see the, the presentation mode. I guess you are now with my screen on your screens, and I'll move forward for the presentation. So, uh, well, first of all, let me already um, say thank you as well uh, to my colleague, the predecessor presentator that were doing the, the two previous presentations. Actually, I think it was really, um, and uh, congratulations to the, to, to the organization because I, I think it's really a, a very well fitting uh, momentum for 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 everything that we've heard so far, and so so I will rather than just talking about what we already know about the Caribbean uh, and particularly Trinidad and Tobago, I will address a few issues more on why is it important to consider OSH as a fundamental uh, right, principle in right at work, and where are we now? Where can we? How can we move forward? Right. So without further um, ado, so uh, the actually well, though uh, there there is a lot of work on OSH already at the ILO since nine, the early nineties, right? So nineteen ninety nine when the ILO was established, and but it was only in twenty twenty two that OSH was considered as a fundamental principle and rights at work. So and it was it's clearly expressed in the ILO Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Right at Work to include a fifth category of fundamental principles and right at work. And this leads to a consequential amendment into the ILO Declaration on Social Justice for a Fair Globalization and into the Global Jobs Pact. And Meaning that this is very important. Why? Because it invites the governing body to take action to introduce consequential amendments to all relevant international labor standards, the tripartite declaration of principles concerning multinational enterprises and social policy, and the ILO declaration on social justice for fair globalization, but not only consequential amendments into this ILO document, but also because the fact that OSH is now considered a fundamental principle and right at work makes and opens an obligation to all member states, even though they have not ratified the conventions and questions, they have the obligation to respect, to promote, and to realize the principles concerning the fundamental right, rights into national laws and international factors. So the previous, what we consider until 2022, the four fundamental principles in right of work were not mainly, were namely freedom of association in respect of recognition of the right to collective bargaining, the elimination of all forms of force or compulsory labor, the effective abolition of child labor, and the elimination of discrimination in respect of employment and occupation. And since last year, we recognize also a safe and healthy working environment as a fundamental principle and right of work. So, and, and this is by recognizing Convention 155 and 187 into the list of the previous eight or eight conventions that were 
considers fundamental. And what do they tell us? So Convention 155, it's really about bringing uh, a policy approach to OSH and the actions required at both national and enterprise level. And then the 187 that brings us uh, kind of a second generation of, of international level standards and it aims the continuous improvement of OSH and progressive achievement of a safe and healthy working environment through the establishment of a system, an OSH system, that can be materialized through a national policy, national system, national programs, um, and really about national preventive safety and health culture. So it's not just about policy, but also the implementation of it, the, the, really the creation of a whole set of tools, instruments, policies, programs that can really support the implementation of a OSH system at country level. And here, just to, as a, a quick overview, just to give you uh, how are we um, on the ratifications and um, if we look into the blue one, the blue spot, uh, it's where the Americas, and here for us at the ILO, when we mention Americas, it's uh, actually um, Americas, including the Caribbean, and I apologize for not having the Caribbean here uh, explicitly mentioned. So as you, you can see, we have more countries that have ratified the 155 and less countries that have ratified the 187. So, and you will ask me, okay, Joanna, fine, but where are we uh, uh, um, considering ratification for the Caribbean? And actually, there is still work to be done regarding ratification. So, we have more countries that have ratified the 155. We have only one country so far that has ratified 187. So meaning that here we have work to do. Not that the, it is important to notice that it doesn't mean that countries are not working on OSH because ratifications are not strictly linked with what countries are doing, rather than rather they are they they, they just explicitly show what countries really are, want to the ILO to know what they are doing. And, but it's also in, important and interesting because when you ratify a convention, it means that it is like a um, really expressive declaration of the country that that country is saying, we want to move forward. We want to do something different. So when a country ratifies, it's really about moving forward. It's really about also showcasing what they have done so far because Sometimes countries have not ratified conventions, but when we do the gap analysis, we realize that actually they already, they are already compliant with what the convention is about, right? So sometimes it's about also showcasing what the country is doing. And sometimes as the, the, my, my, the, the first speaker told us, it's also about kind of creating an entry point of how the country can set up and how the country can move forward and and really bring OSH to the center of some decision. And again, this uh, actually a little bit as uh, here in Trinidad, uh, the work on OSH has started really, really like, it's not something, even though the, um, the convention 155 it's already after um it's already it's from 81 1981 it's true that the work on osh was um already identified and started long before that so in 1919 the ILO constitution um notes that the protection of the worker against sickness disease and injury arising out of his employment is among the improvements that urgent that are urgently required, right? So it was not just after; it was already in the beginning that OSH was considered as something really important and urgent. Then, in 1944, if we go into the ILO Declaration of Philadelphia concerning the aims and purposes of the ILO, 
uh, it identifies as solemn obligation of the organization to further program that will achieve adequate protection for the life and health of workers in all occupations. And then in 1966, if we go to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, meaning going beyond the international standards, there was also, there is also Article 7b that recognized the right to safe and healthy working conditions. And then there we are in 1981, the Occupational Safety and Health Convention and its accompanying recommendations, they were adopted. Right, so they are the instruments that set up the primary principles to improve safety and health of work, both at the national and workplace level. And the discussion continued, right? Because as we noticed from 1919, that there were already uh, been identified OSH as something that was urgently required. So in 1998, in the ILO Declaration on Fundamental Principles of Private Work, it's also, it, it represents a landmark political statement because it confirms the obligation and commitment that are inherent in membership of the ILO. Again, to respect, promote, and realize in good faith and in accordance with the Constitution the principles concerning the fundamental right. So, OSH was not yet considered as a fundamental right, but this is important to notice because. Mm -hmm. When they started to organize conventions by distinct orders, so we have the fundamental conventions, we have the governance conventions, and then we have the technical conventions. And when they recognized there was not about being more important than the other, but it's being really fundamental because it's like the basis of the basis of the rights that we need to ensure in the and then on 23, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, 2003, we, uh, the, the global strategy on OSH was adopted at the, at the ILC in its uh, 91st session. And this strategy reaffirmed the role of the ILO in fostering a preventive approach to reducing work-related accidents and diseases through a wider promotion of a national preventive safety and health culture and better management of occupational safety and health, both at the national and enterprise level. And then, of course, the work that was done between 2003 and 2006 was the preparation of the 187, so the Promotional Framework for Occupational Safety and Health Convention and its accompanying recommendation, 197, that were adopted. And they call for the creation of a national preventive force culture and the promotion and advancement of all relevant levels of the right of workers to a safe and healthy working environment. And from here, the work was really to push for between 2006 and 2022, it was really to push the OSH to be recognized as a fundamental principle and right of work. And then we have from 2008, the ILO Declaration on Social Justice for Fair Globalization that also made a particular significant, um, uh, identified uh, uh, the, the fundamental rights as particular and significant. Then we have the Global Jobs, Jobs Pact in 2009 that also we addressed and called for um, a social impact of the global crisis on employment. And then 2010, um, the plan of action to achieve widespread ratification and effective implementation of OSH instruments. And then 2009, again, 2019, with uh, the centenary declaration um, of the resolution that we affirm and state that safe and healthy working conditions are fundamental to decency. And then on 2022, finally, the resolution on the inclusion of a safe and healthy working environment in, in the ILO's framework of fundamental principles and right of work that was adopted. And the resolution, the right of, to a safe and healthy working environment is recognized as a fundament, fundamental principle and right of work and both Conventions, so 155 and 187, 
are declared fundamental conventions, right? So this means that they are now really recognized as a guarantee that needs to be taken into account. And regardless ratification, countries need to look at them as fundamental rights. So this is just to give you a general idea. I'm not going to go through it, just to, to, to um, give you a general idea of all the different um, conventions that are in place, that are in force, up-to-date instruments on OSH. So I, if, if you want, well, my presentation will be, uh, I will make available for, for, for the organizers to, to share if, if someone wants. Um, and then you can check all the different things. So we have uh, protection against specific risks. We have general provisions. We have protection of specific group of workers and protection in specific branches of activity. So you will find a panoply of different instruments, different uh, conventions, recommendations that can really guide and can really be a, a, a something that can facilitate governments, workers, and employers to promote OSH at the country level. So where are we now? Um, I'm not going through the, the next slides. I will skip a few of them. I'll, but I will just wanted to kind of bring to you where are we considering the overview of the global implementation status of some key elements that contain that are contained in the fundamental OSH convention and that we consider that are essential for the realization of a safe and healthy working environment. Again, I'm not going through all of the slides, but I wanted to make sure that if the presentation is shared to you, you can go, you can come up with uh, whenever you want. What what was that John at all? Where can we find this? Where can we find that? And at the end, you will see that I we have a few links and a few materials that you can always reach and you can always look for. So what we consider that it is essential to know where are we, right? So first of all, and as um, my predecessor also talked about, the existence of a national authority responsible for OSH. And not a national authority, but also, also a national tripartite body on OSH. And again, of course, the inclusion of key provisions in the national legal framework the policy level to orientate us, and the protection against undue consequences for workers who, who remove themselves from dangerous work situations. It is also important to, to know where are we regarding the requirement to establish a joint OSH committee at the workplace level to promote cooperation between management, workers, and their representatives. Again, and not um, also very important, the adoption of a national policy, development of the national program, and establishing the establishment of a national reporting and notification system for occupational accidents and diseases. So regarding authority or a body responsible for OSH, what, how to guide us? How can the Convention 155 and Convention 187 can guide us? on the requirement of establishing a, of an authority or a body that is responsible for OSH. Um, usually the OSH bodies are charged with developing and implementing a national OSH policy, the program and the respective legislation. But of course, in consultation with the most representative organizations of employers and workers. And we can say that fortunately, nearly all ILO member states have an authority or a responsible body for OSH. So 80% of them are actually housed in the Ministry of Labor or a similar body. And in some other cases, OSH bodies are housed in Ministry of Social Affairs or Health or Economic Development, depending on the uh, organic organizational, um, how, the, uh, how governments are organized between uh, and in some countries. Um, regarding the national tripartite body, 79% of ILO member states have indeed a national tripartite body. So Convention 187 requires that the member state should set up 
uh, a national tripartite advisory body to address OSH issues, right? And of course, if it's a tripartite, it means that it is imposed on equal number by government's uh, employers and workers representatives. And some, sometimes, depending on the countries and how the how they are organized, OSH bodies may also be established at regional or local levels, or as as well as at sectoral levels, particularly or especially in hazard industries. This is a, an overview on how we are. And for instance, here in the Caribbean, uh, if we consider the 13 member states, so not mentioning the, the, the territories covered by the ILO office, for instance, the 13 member states, from the 13, there are eight member states that have a national tripartite body. And Besides the the, the, um, the, the bodies, the, the, the institutions that are created, there is also, of course, the need to establish a comprehensive prevention-based OSH legal framework, right? So, and it should be something very generic that can be applicable to all branches of economic activities and all workers without distinction. So, no discrimination at all. And it should include, as also, we have seen previously the principle of prevention, national infrastructure, continuous improvement of national OSH governance, general outcome basis OSH duties for all relevant stakeholders, the workplace processes to manage it, uh, participate collaborative and cooperative arrangements at the workplace, collaboration, the rights of workers to remove themselves from the dangerous situations, other key prerogatives of workers like training, the, the, the PTI, well, and all legally defined sanctions and sanctioning procedures, right? So, and this is very important as well. And together with the law, and there is the, the point again that uh, the protection against and due consequences for workers who remove themselves from dangerous work situations. And here we can see that 68% of ILO member states do protect workers from undue consequences if they remove themselves from dangerous situations. And 80% of the ILO member states that have ratified, so not all of the member states, but 80% of those that have ratified the 155 recognize the workers' right to remove themselves from a dangerous work situation without and view consequences. And again, here we can see, for instance, here we have the, the, the percentage uh, altogether Latin America and the Caribbean, and we have that 70% of member states with provisions in national legislation allowing workers to remove themselves from dangerous situations without and view consequences. And okay, we have seen the, the law, the, the possibility to remove the workers to remove themselves from dangerous situations, the need to have all these uh, committees and all, all these privatized governance bodies that can really support the policy and the implementation of the, of the program. And then it's also very important to, to check on how are we on the requirement to establish a joint OSH committee at the workplace. So national, eventually regional or uh, local or sectoral level, but also at the workplace level. And here is where conventions number 155 and 187 really promote cooperation at the workplace level between management, workers, and their representatives. And here we have 70% of the ILO member states that have provisions in national legislation for the establishment of these workplace joint OSH committees. And from those countries, member states that have ratified the Convention 155 and that are considered high income countries, 92% uh, of them require the establishment of a workplace joint OSH committee. So they not just have the provision for it, but they require this establishment. 
And here again, uh, a little bit of your review on the new world. And I, I choose to put it all the, the world because I think it's also important not only to kind of benchmark with the Americas or Latin America, but also throughout the world. Because I believe that OSH is not just about the regional thing, but really about worldwide. What are the others doing better or what are the others doing that is really good that I can take as an example for me. And then, of course, uh, the importance of having national OSH policies. So uh, right now, we have 47% uh, of ILO member states with the national OSH policy. So both of them, both conventions, requ require member states to formulate, but not only design, really to implement and peri periodically review national policy on OSH, because as we have heard before, this is a constant evolution. The world of work has changed dramatically, right? So we need to make sure that our OSH policies are adequate and really address the needs that the, 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 the world of work is having and the needs that the workers, the protection that they need are adequately provided. So according to Convention 155, the aim of the policy shall be to prevent work-related accidents and diseases, and so far the, the reasonable, practical, the risks in the working, and minimizing uh, the reasonably, practical, the risks in the working environment. So it's not about what do we do after the accident or the disease, it's, more, it's also what we do to prevent it. Right, so and then Convention 187 adds up um, on Convention 155 and adds the promotion of basic principles such as assessing occupational risks and hazards, as we just um, uh, heard from my, my predecessor, uh, and combating occupational risks or hazards of source, right? So preventing rather than just addressing uh, after and developing a national preventive safety and health culture. So about the system, not just the policy itself, but everything that is related with and all the bodies and all the institutes or all the, the departments that go with. So and then again, after the policy, the program, the importance of having a program, here is where we see that we start to have less percentage of member states with a, with that really um, respond to this to to this measure. So only 34% of ILO member states have a national OSH program, and only 8% of low-income countries have a national OSH program. Meaning that it is not that bad, let's say, for the policy. But when we talk about when we start to move into the implementation, there is where the bottlenecks start to to appear. So that means that this is where we really need to work, where countries need to put the emphasis on and we need to move forward with it. And so national OSH programs are very important. And we can find in Convention 187 that there's really this requirement for member states to design, to formulate, but also again implement, monitor, evaluate. So meaning again that this is not something that we do once in a lifetime, it's something that we do once and we keep following up and we keep improving and we keep addressing it. And a national OSH program refers to any national program that includes objectives to be achieved in a predetermined time frame. So it's not like, again, like a 15 years time, it's more about four period of four years, five years, three years, depending on the country and then priorities and means of actions formulated. So it's not about just putting nice words, but it's also about knowing how we are going to do it, how we are going to measure it. Um, and countries have developed OSH programs as specific national strategies on OSH or as OSH plans integrated into broader programs, meaning that we eventually don't need to have an OSH program outside something, but we can have it integrated into a broader program if there is any at the country level. And last but not least, and I hope I'm not taking a lot of your time, um, I would like to, to 
take your attention to, to the national reporting and notification system for accidents and diseases because sometimes we think a lot about the, the, the policy, the framework, the program, but it's sometimes we do tend to not to fully, it's not about forgetting, but not to fully address and follow up on the national recording and notification system for accidents and diseases. And this is very important. So, and that's why both inventions are either 155 and 187 call the attention to, put the attention into the provision of governing recording and notification systems, right? So, and uh, the, the protocol of 2002, the convention 155, specifically adopted, to pro was specifically adopted to promote the harmonization of reporting and notification system. Um, the collection of and analysis of data is essential for identifying their causes and detecting new hazards and emergencies. So this is key to define priorities and design effective preventive strategies on OSH at all levels. Because if we know where accidents and diseases are happening more, either at sectoral level or or any or eventually in a regional level, depending on the the, the, the notifications that we receive, that can support either government, either workers, employers really to kind of build up upon that and really define priorities and design strategies, preventive strategies to address those key issues. So if we have this reporting, this will allow us to do better policy, this will allow us to do better program and really to define effective preventive strategies. Um, and yeah, so under reporting of occupational diseases and injuries, remains a global challenge. So this is not just the Caribbean, it's worldwide. Um, and it is a challenge even where reporting and notification systems exist, right? I can give you here, for instance, an example um, that sometimes because the, and this re that relates uh, OSH with social protection, because um, the, the responses, so, the, the answers when um, an accident occurs, when a, uh, a work-related disease comes, the fact that they are not properly addressed on under a social security benefit, that might lead to uh, a reporting that it's not, that it's a kind of a fake reporting. Why? Because the worker, instead of reporting the accident as uh, a work-related, accident it will say that it was an accident outside so it can benefit from some some social security benefits that are more related with sickness and with other with other possibilities rather than the the, the work related accidents or the disease um, work related so here is where the notification system can be really even if it exists it can be really kind of completely not used. So meaning that we won't be ready at the country level to know what is really happening. So here the idea of the notification systems are very important and then how to relate them with social security benefits that are available at the workplace and at the country level. So really, but this is really important because if we want to have better policies, if we want to have programs that really address the needs we need to know what is happening really in real time. So again, um, this was the last one, but not the least one. And just to, to finalize, to, to leave you with a quote from our actual di uh, Director General of the ILO. So Mr. Ubo has said that we have an essential responsibility to ensure that people go to work and come home alive and injured and healthy. This year, on the World Day for Safety and Health at Work, we can celebrate an important step towards this goal, the designation of a safe and healthy working environment as a fundamental principle and right at work. So here are the some references uh, that you can find in the internet, uh, a report that was done uh, for this year, the booklet that go 
with the brochure that um, stands for the OSH as a fundamental principle at work. And these are just really the three examples or the four examples for this year, because if you go to our website, you will find a lot more information about OSH and how to, what to do, how to do, and how to move forward. So thank you so much for your time, for your attention. Um, um, feel free to contact me even um, outside the, uh, this next uh, few minutes that we'll have to share questions and answers. And again, thank you so much for the invitation. Okay, well, thank you for that informative presentation, Dr. Borges. Um, so I believe we've now come to the end of our presentation for this World Day for Safety and Health at Work uh, 2023, where we um, discussed the designation of safety and health as a fundamental principle and rights at work. Um, we've had three presenters, Dr. Henry, who took us through a review um, of where we have come from as a country in terms of um, our safety and health legislation and um, where we need to be, um, I dare say, and where, where, we, where we actually are now. Um, he made a point of, of, of um, informing us about the fact that we, in, we, we keep playing catch up with legislation in other parts of the world, and, and we are. Um, but uh, with this, this safety and health designation uh, this year, hopefully um, we will then have the impetus to then catch up with where we need to be. Um, we were followed by um, Ms. Mer Ms. Mercer Banwat Bawani, who is the director of, um, of at the THA, who spoke about the employees and employers' responsibility. Um, and again, that was another riveting um, an informative presentation which looked at principles um, that the, the employee responsibilities and em employees as well. Spoke about policy, also spoke about risk assessments, spoke about employee responsibilities and ensuring that when employers provide these facilities that they would also make sure and use them so that they would remain safe at work. Um, and then we had Mrs. Ms. Borges who spoke about um, the ILO's process and making our fundamental principle and right at work, um, which had some key points in terms of um, data as to where the countries are um, in terms of their establishment of policy and programs. And the statistics didn't look too bad, but I think we uh, it's a work in progress and we are working towards not just 47%, but say 100%, um, hopefully that, that is the dream. Um, so another another point that was made in, in Ms. Borges' is, um, which is very, very fundamental for all our operations is the importance of data and making sure that we collect data in real time um, so that we can ensure um, that we are able to plan programs and preventative measures are put in place for diseases and, and, and issues that come up in OSH, because as you know, OSH is a dynamic um, discipline and things change every every so often. So um, without further ado, uh, we will go into the, the, the questions uh, segment, and I have a few questions here. Um, are the presenters uh, ready? So take questions, uh, are they all here? Dr. Henry? Uh, is there a question directed at me? <laughs> I, I, think I, saw, yeah. no, I, I think I, I saw I, a question <laughs> about the, the impact of, um, of AI. Um, right, that, that, yeah, that question is, uh, um, is yeah, it, it, it is one of the questions, yes. But well, we have a question here that says, um, in terms of 
the college in particular, um, exactly what are the emotional, mental health challenges at CCLS among employees? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 Carolyn, you and I share a common thing in that we um, we manage government institutions. <laughs> government institutions have their, their own challenges, but what we've done at the college is that we have, in our strategic plan, our latest strategic plan, um, we have as one of our key strategic objectives the creation of a safe and a safe and healthy workplace. Right. And we have identified a series of practical things that we do that, that we believe we can do, including um, twice yearly um, staff safety and health uh, staff wellness uh, surveys to understand uh, what is the what is the perception of staff because even as you address issues related to lighting, noise, etc., unless people feel that they are in a healthy workplace, um, we believe that there's a relationship to productivity because we believe satisfied and comfortable workers are better workers. So we have identified um, health and safety, the provision of a health and sa healthy and safe working environment uh, as one of our strategic objectives. Um, we know that, uh, for example, we have had, we had a tragedy last week where a member of our staff was um, was killed in a drive-by, in, 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 in a shooting. And we, we recognize oh how traumatic that is and what the what the impact could be so we we are doing counseling and we recognize too that uh, in Trinidad and Tobago and the rest of the Caribbean where crime is on the rise um that people that that, that is one of the stresses that people are having in in their work life All right okay thanks very much Dr. Henry for that I mean, that mental health issue question could go on all day if you, <laughs> the answer, the response to that could go on for quite a long time when you look at different perspectives and the different issues people present and work with. So it's really a, a really broad question. But um, uh, condolences with regards to the member of staff, that, that is a sad thing. Yeah. Um, the other question is, um, well, what specifically are the issues? From my point, CCL, CS has vastly improved our conditions. I this is the question that they posted. I gather that that was a comment. I know what we've done is in over the last several years we have uh, we've made considerable investments in improving the the, the the physical facilities to create a safer, right. healthier uh, physical environment because we recognize I can't. As an institution, I can't embarrass Mr. Paris Ram uh, <laughs> with him teaching safety and health, health and safety, getting recognition by IOSH, and then I have him bringing um, bringing students and have staff in a in a less than ideal uh, environment. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, there's another question here. How does this definition impact the online students' customers at CCLCS? I, I, I thought it was a discussion on a work environment. I didn't want a discussion on a teaching environment. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we have found is that when we transition to online, because as a result of the pandemic, and the pandemic, as I said, highlighted for us the issues of um, health and say, uh, health and wellness. Um, because we were 100% face-to-face school, and then in a matter of two weeks, we had to transition to a 100% 100 um, online school. Let's deal first with our teachers and our staff, 
that in and of itself was a traumatic issue for our staff because our staff were not accustomed um, to to um, to teaching online, and even our support staff were not accustomed to providing the full range of services online. So that created that certainly created some stresses, as I'm sure it did for every workplace in the in the region, and and I think across the world. And what we had to try to do was because we there were all sorts of implications. We had people working from home, people using their own equipment, people using their own utilities, and and just a full range of new stressors that um, staff did not have to have to deal with. I think in terms of how we approach that from the perspective of an employer is first, we were very sensitive to the, the new types of demands we were making of people. We were also constrained in that while we were asking people to take on additional responsibilities, we did not have the resources to compensate people, um, to, to provide additional compensation. Um, so we, like everywhere else, we had to manage that as best as we could. With regard to our students, we have done a, a number of surveys of, of our students, and what we found is that overwhelmingly, um, our students do not wish to go back to face-to-face -face because the college is unique in that upward of 90% of our students are working people. And what they found is that the online approach, the, the, the online modality, allowed them greater flexibility and they are now able to better balance their family life, their work life, and their academic life. Right. So, so in a sense, uh, our students who are working people, we may have, by going online, reduce one of their stressors that uh, that relieve them in the workplace. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Henry. And this question is for Ms. Um, Bawani. Um, what improvements in the present of regulations can be made in, in Trinidad and Tobago? Well... That's something. Marissa, are you, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Um, Would you like I to do that? that? Okay. Question. I, you <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. It, 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 it did cross my mind, but being a senior lawyer, well, my role today is wearing another hat. Um, um, <laughs> just off the top of my head, um, mm -hmm. well, they said improvement in OSH regulations. I think. We should have more regulations that help to better guide the employers and what they need to put in place with respect to health and safety um, across the board. So that's, that's mm -hmm. my answer. Well, thank you so much for that, Marissa. Um, right, this question is from Ms. Portis. Um, with a trend towards work at home, how is this policy relevant to work in 2023? Can I ask you to, to repeat, please? With the trend towards working from home, how is this policy relevant to work in 2023? I'm not sure if I captured the... what... Um, I think they're asking... They, the declaration that Ira has recently made in terms of work being a fundamental right. Um, they're asking how, how it, it connects, how is it relevant to working from home? Because, you know, with COVID coming and the work environment changing so much, Dr. Henry just spoke about the fact that people would prefer to, you know, work from home and, 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 and um, actually conduct business from home in terms of college affairs. Um, I think they're looking for how how does the, this new fundamental right um, affect, in your opinion, um, working from home arrangements? Well, when we do the all the ILO conventions and recommendations, we don't kind of say usually, and 
I think I've mentioned that they are for all old workers, meaning all types of workers in all mm -hmm. sectors, right? So right. we mentioned that uh, particularly these two, the 155 and the 187, we find them quite really open to all. So it doesn't, it, you may have, you may work from home, you may work you, like teleworking or even if you are, for instance, a self-employed worker, that you are doing translation, for instance, right? So you don't mm -hmm. need to have a, a workplace kind of uh, an office, let's say. So really, when we talk about the ILO as a particularly OSHA, the fundamental principle and right at work, we don't make any discrimination, right? So it's really about every type of workers in any circumstances. Right. Mm -hmm. So but it's not about being here or there. It's really about safety and health, right? It's right. about having the proper conditions. And eventually, for instance, we can think, um, I, I would just kind of, while I'm talking, to think about uh, an example. And of course, that, for instance, when we think about teleworking for a company, um, yes, it is indeed uh, important. And I think that's also something that we can address here. For instance, if a company says, okay, now we are doing teleworking like two, three times per week, right? So we need to ensure that wherever you are working from, that you have the proper conditions, right? So mm -hmm. meaning like a proper desk, a chair, uh, the internet connection, the laptop, right? When we, depending on the type of work that we are doing, but I, I, I think that if you are talking about teleworking, we are talking about a something that needs uh, computer based, right? So not really manual or uh, uh, something like a, in a production line. So uh, yes, for sure that it doesn't mind where you are, what you are doing, you need to have safety and you, you need to be protected to ensure that you won't have, particularly for instance, when you're talking about working from home and we're talking about, again, mental health, it's very important, right? We were talking about even the occupational diseases that may arise because you are not, uh, you have not a proper desk or a chair where you will be doing your work. That may, if you don't protect those things, that may eventually lead to then a, um, a professional disease, right? So yes, it is important regardless where you are or what you do. Right. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I have another question for you as well. Um, what, are the, what are the penalties, if any, for member states that do not abide by conventions? Well, we don't have penalties. <laughs> it's really about, well, unless, so first of all, a country ratifies whenever he thinks uh, he's uh, ready to do it, right? So ratifications are not mandatory, but, but of course they are, uh, if you we we think that the most countries the more countries have ratifying conventions it means they are really compliant and they really want to move forward and have the international level standards uh, in place in their countries right that's the first mm. thing. secondly we don't have a, a penalty for not ratifying or not be compliant with because this is not about the ilo but more at the country level right so the recognitions from workers and employers and the overall population about how is my country doing regarding this or that aspect, right? So, and, and here is that where sometimes I wouldn't call it a penalty, but eventually if there is really a kind of a, a really high level of non-compliance, this is where um, workers or employers or whoever in at the country level can make a complaint at the ILO level, but this has right. to be particularly, for instance, usually the complaints are more regarding liberty of expression, so everything related with the, with the first set of uh, fundamental rights or the discrimination or in case of um, child labor aspect or um, forced labor, right? So yes, but there is no kind of no pen penalty because we prefer to address the issues regarding how to move and how to change the situation. So it's not about penalties, but more about how can we ensure 
that a country can be compliant with. And by being compliant, it means that at the country level, this has a, a, a good impact, right? So we have good practices, we have good policies, good programs that really prevent us and prevent workers from having occupational safety, uh, occupational um, injuries and diseases. So this is what I would tend to say regarding ratification and the compliance with ratification. Okay. Um, there's another question. Is there a time frame for ratifying these conventions? No, no, not at all. As I mentioned, it is really when a country feels it is prepared to ratify. So, for instance, a country can ratify even if it's not completely kind of in compliance with the recommendation. So, it's it's uh, in this case, the ratification will be understood as um, uh, 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 the country wanting to move forward and really being uh, will introduce the, the changes after the ratification. It can be the contrary. It can be a country will ratify when it feels that we are 100% compliant with, with, the, with, the, with what the convention says. And this is kind of a showcasing that we are compliant with what is what, is, uh, what regards the, the specific convention. And so it doesn't have to be this time or that time. It's really about the country time. So whenever they feel ready to do it, knowing that when a country ratifies, it's again, it's a recognition of the work done or really the engagement to do, to do something. And then the, the eventually it will also enhance more support and more more possibilities for the country to, to receive more funds. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is to Dr. Henry. Uh, how do you see artificial intelligence affecting us in the future? Dr. Henry? Okay. <laughs> I, I, I think whoever asked that question decided that I, I don't have enough stress in my work life. <laughs> I, I, I will make a, I, I'll make some observations. I think already artificial intelligence is creating a level of anxiety um, in the workforce because it is creating a fair degree of uncertainty because I think even the experts do not know with any level of certainty where artificial intelligence is going and what will be the impact it would have on, on, on the workplace. But I think the greatest anxiety is coming from a, uh, a sense of a loss of employment security. And um, that is creating um, among workers now just, just a, it is just an additional stressor that I suspect may be having an, an impact on, um, on, on, on people's level of wellness in the workplace. In terms of how it will affect um, different types of work, um, and I think even in knowledge work, which some people feel might be the place that um, workers will feel the greatest impact on artificial intelligence. But I think even certain types of it, it would affect different types of knowledge work differently as and similarly it would have affect different types of of manual labor differently i think part of the we, we, we just have to have as much information as we can and at this point provide uh, provide workers with um, information so that they can manage um, this unfolding unfolding process. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Henry. 
Uh, this question is from Ms. Bavani, and it is, what is being put in place by all companies, you can look at companies in Tobago, to take the OSH Act seriously? Can you repeat the question for me, please? What is being put in place for all companies to take the OSH Act seriously? You can answer from your perspective and, and your experience. Well, I could talk from the, the THA perspective. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we have been working, the, the things that we do at the Health and Safety Department, all of our activities are geared towards um, establishing a safe and healthy working environment for the Tobago House of Assembly. So I'll just mention a few of the things we do. We conduct risk assessments in all the divisions. This is to assess um, what hazards are there and we provide reports to the heads so that they may implement the corrective action that is recommended. We also develop emergency response plans based on those risk assessments. So in the event of an emergency in the workplace, uh, workers know what they have to do and are able to evacuate in a safe manner. Um, we also do training for employees with respect to, so based on our risk assessments and our inspections that we do, we would identify areas where training is needed so that employees can carry out their jobs in a safer way. So we may recognize that maybe they have poor housekeeping or their chemicals are not being stored in the correct way. So we would tailor a training session for them to learn how to do housekeeping properly or learn how to properly store their chemicals in a safe way in the workplace. So those are some of the things that are being done by the well by the OSH Department of the Tobago House of Assembly to ensure that um, they do have a safe and healthy working environment for employees. Thank you very much. Um, this question is from Ms. Borges. Um, how can we encourage member states to improve policies, regulations, and laws to ensure us as a fundamental principle and right of the worker? Well, so they're asking about encouragement. How do we do? Well, actually, it's about uh, making sure that the workers are aware of the a lot of advocacy for it, right? So that's what we try to do with the island. With the island, really to support and to whenever a member state has uh, kind of identified something that they want to do, uh, with us, I mean, or without us, we are always supportive, right? Because the important thing is that the engagement and the will to do it. So how do we do it? It's really about engaging with member states, engaging with particularly the, either the government or the employers or the workers, and really about uh, raising awareness for, for the importance of particularly OSH, um, everything related with OSH. And uh, when I say supporting, it's like we uh, follow up with member states, what do they need, what, where should we start by, um, what can be done? Either is at the either uh, at the design policy level or programming or training. So it's really about finding what the country wants, needs, and then from there moving forward with whatever it's needed. Right. So the support that it's needed, I, uh, particularly at the technical level, because that's what we. As a technical agency, that's what we really want to, to bring. It's the technical advice, it's the technical support, um, to ensure that more and more member states can be fully compliant with, with, with international labor standards. Because at the end, that's what, regardless of the type of activity that we do, the most important thing for us is to ensure and advocate for the, the international labor standards. Right? So, and how to implement them at the country. And yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much for that. And Dr. Henry, this question um, is for you. Um, it says, um, 
with the government attending, attempting to add work from home policies to our workforce. Would Cipriani be pioneering the adjustments to the OSH Act to cover the safety and health of employees? We can't, we can't pioneer uh, <laughs> what, what, what we, what I see us doing is that we recognize that with um, work from home, it creates, as I said earlier, it creates a whole other set of industrial relations um, issues that we need to address. And as I indicated, one of the commitments we are making as a labor college is that we will explore these issues and we would do our best to provide um, evidence-based options on how some of these things can be can be addressed. Yes. So certainly oh. in our in our research and in our writings, and if persons have been looking at our weekly column in the Guardian and even some of our other publications, you would see that we we keep weighing in on, on many of these issues. Okay, great. Right, so um, at this point, there are no more questions. We, I think we've come to the end of the question segment. I think um, maybe Dr. Henry will be relieved because some of those questions coming at him were quite, um, <laughs> you know, that, that, that. I think but, they were um, out, of the world, out of this world this morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> some of them were beyond and beyond. Um, but um, this, uh, we've come to the and I really want to thank everyone for participating. It has been a pleasure for me being here. I'd like to extend um, thanks for, to Dr. Henry for um, formulating and spearheading uh, this program today from the Cipriani perspective, Cipriani Labor um, College's perspective. It was really relevant, and I think the participants and the um, the, the, the the listeners um, and viewers would would have appreciated this today. Um, I think it's really something that, that should be done not only in safety week, but you know, at other times. But I do understand about the um, competing priorities that people have in their schedules. But thank you so much, Dr. Henry. Um, thank you, Ms. Bavani from Tobago. It, it, it's really good to have you from the sister isle um, <laughs> to hear what's been going on over there. And so your presentation as well was um, was very, very relevant to about 60% of, of, of the country who still um, make up the workforce in terms of the employers and employees um, and reminding people of their responsibilities. And Ms. Borges, thanks so much for, for giving us that international perspective um, as we, we hone into the, the new declaration from the ILO um, and we work towards making it a reality here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so, I mean, if there are any, any other comments from Dr. Henry um, at all before we close? I just want to correct one thing that you said. Yes. Right? This is the I am very proud and pleased to say this is the this entire week of activity and this panel is the brainchild of Mr. Barry Parisram. Right. Mm -hmm. The program dean for occupational health and safety, and I am pleased to say my former student. And mm -hmm. uh, so if there is any. Congratulations and acknowledgement. It's it is certainly to to Barry, and I want to pay tribute um, to his hard work, and to mention spe uh, specifically to um, his able colleague, Mr. Donald Ali. And right. I, and I, I I will give Barry the the, the, the last word. Thank you very much, Doc. Barry? Thank you very much, Doc, and thank you very much, Ms. Sancho, for accepting the um, invitation to chair. Um, it was indeed a, a pleasure to, to have you, and as well, Ms. Marissa Bowani, who is also an adjunct um, lecturer in the best department at Cipriani College, the, the OSH department. Uh, <laughs> and of course, um, thank you very much to Mrs. 
um, Borges um, Onrics. It was really a pleasure looking at all the all the um, figures, conventions, and all those laws that you would have um, placed there, and looking at the um, at the member states and those who should um, abide as well. So thank you very much. Um, just to tell that you know that today is just the start of our OSH week. Um, tomorrow and Thursday we have an OSH Expo. That's Wednesday 26th and Thursday 27th. We have an um, expo that will display OSH products, policies, procedures from various companies throughout um, Trinidad and, and Tobago. So I just want to extend an invitation to all of you come out and enjoy yourselves. I know that the, the weather is a bit um, inclement at the, at the moment, but, but I'm, I'm sure that when you come, um, you will be um, happy. So thank you very much once again. I, I just want to extend a special invitation to Joanna to, to if you can, uh, visit with us either tomorrow or Thursday at the college. We will be happy to have you at our facility. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, okay. All right. So, um, well, I think that brings us to the end of the proceedings for today. Again, well, thank you, Mr. Parasra, and your team. Um, as well, so and um, Dr. Henry had um, extended um, his gratitude towards you, but the program today has been a, a good and fruitful one, and I thoroughly enjoyed it myself. Um, and so, thanks everyone, and have a good day.